Mother, oh God, Mother, blood, blood. In the great boxing match of genre versus society, smart people would put their money on society. Here's a picture illustrating their conceptual sizes. So in the fight between the two, society generally wins. Society influences genre a lot more than genre influences society. That all said, in some very rare cases, it can go the other way. And rather than just being a reflection of society, genre can help to shape some part of it. One of the best illustrations of this from any genre is Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 film, Psycho. Psycho is a really good example of the type of films being produced as the authority of the Motion Picture Production Code, or the Hayes Code, was beginning to wane and dissolve and decay. Remember, the Hayes Code was the American set of guidelines that operated between 1930 and 1968, dictating some of the do's and don'ts of cinema. For example, like no lustful or excessive kissing. Why don't you call your boss and tell him you're taking the rest of the afternoon off? Friday anyway, and hot. From the very first scene, Psycho is already pushing the envelope. Janet Lee's in a bra, and it's clear she's been making illicit afternoon love, and it's clear she's not married. All right. What do we do instead? Write each other lurid love letters? I have to go, Sam. 45 minutes later, in one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history, we see her stabbed to death in the shower. Something that not only challenged the Hayes Code, but the audience's basic understanding of how narrative should operate. It's kind of the equivalent of killing Balaroff halfway through the first Twilight book, or killing off Leonardo DiCaprio before he even gets onto the Titanic. Beyond that, the film is stuffed with breaches of the code. We see a toilet flush for the first time in cinema history. And Norman Bates details how to get away with murder. We also get to see his mother's corpse. Mrs. Bates. In terms of Psycho having an impact on wider society, it's not so much that Hitchcock broke the conventions of the Hayes Code, because a lot of other films at the time were doing that too, but that the film was so financially successful while doing so. Hitchcock had somehow managed to tap into his audience's desire for death and smut, and with a budget of only 800,000, it managed to make 60 million. The result is that a lowly genre product, a B-styled horror movie, ended up having an impact on society, and it did this in at least two quantifiable ways. Firstly, it helped to further damage the moral authority of the Hayes Code, helping to facilitate its eventual demise in 1968. Basically, if Hitchcock could make stacks of cash by ignoring the code, then why wouldn't other filmmakers do exactly the same thing? Secondly, it had a huge impact on the type of movies being made, effectively becoming a forerunner for the slasher genre, a huge subgenre of horror. Without Psycho, there would be no slasher genre. John Carpenter, director of 1978's slasher classic Halloween, was directly inspired by Psycho. Which is why he cast Jamie Lee Curtis as his lead, because she was daughter of Janet Lee, who you best know as the lady from the shower. Carpenter has opined that the scariest part in Psycho is when Bates jerks out from a side door and sends Arbogast reeling backwards down the stairs. That moment of coming out of nowhere influenced me for Halloween. I thought, well, if you establish this guy and you establish he can be anywhere, then the audience is going to start to believe he's anywhere in any shadow. Hitchcock's stylistic signature lurks all over the horror genre. It's the omnipresence of evil, and it's that classic jump scare that we all still know and love today. Hitchcock also famously said that blondes make the best victims. They're like virgin snow that shows up the bloody footprints. And this is another legacy of Psycho, the unsettling blend of sex and violence, and what some would argue are now the worst elements of the slasher genre, a kind of violent, eroticized misogyny. Whenever a female character locks herself away in a bathroom and begins to undress, for better or worse, the looming sense of dread that accompanies this is a direct descendant of Psycho. <laughs> It's important to note here that where there's money to be made from a product, there's always going to be replications and knockoffs. And maybe this is an excellent indicator of success. When people start trying to sell an inferior version of your product, you know you've made it. 
By 1963, films like Blood Feast were tearing the tongues out of innocent, fair-haired women, or tearing their arms off in 2000 Maniacs. In Britain, Hammer Horror took cues from Hitchcock's work, and in the US, the slasher genre continued to grow, becoming gorier and dumber, exploiting the most sensational aspects of the genre, gore and sex, until, by the early 1990s, the bubble had well and truly burst, and formulaic slasher films had ceased to be profitable ventures. Some guy just killed Tracy. He cut the line. Hitchcock also helped to cement a new type of villain. Unlike enemies that came from outer space or that were the mutant byproduct of radioactive poisoning, Norman Bates was the boy next door. He wasn't particularly hairy, he didn't have fangs, and he wasn't going to turn into a bat. Bates was based on real life mama's boy and freak show Ed Gein, pictured here wearing a rather fetching hat. The difference is that in Psycho, Hitchcock actively attempted to humanize Bates, making him young and urbane and somewhat sympathetic, like me. By doing this, he helped shift the way that audiences perceived horror. The antagonist didn't have to be an external enemy. It could be an internal one. A sickness that didn't show itself until the victim was already lying dead-eyed on the bathroom tile. While seemingly small, I do think that this is another example of how a single genre product can have an influence on society. That it can help to move the genre forward, rather than it being simply a reflection of time and place. It's not as if she were a, a maniac. A raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. Before jumping ahead to another genre-defining moment, it's important to look at how technology changed over the 70s and 80s, because that influenced how films were actually made and how audiences consumed them. At the risk of generalizing wildly, schlock horror, or slasher horror in the 70s and 80s, fell into a fairly formulaic pattern. Promiscuous teens, although particularly women, were chased down by a killer, and the killer really enjoyed the artistry of their work and the screams of their victims. Whether the killer was a real person, like in Friday the 13th, or a spectral entity, like in Nightmare on Elm Street, didn't really matter because the overall narrative arcs were pretty much the same. New technology helped the movies become increasingly gory, and look away now if you don't want to see Kevin Bacon get an arrow through the throat. But it also helped facilitate mass consumption, and with mass consumption came an awareness of the standardized and generally fairly simplistic slasher plots as a whole. Believe it or not, but before the 1970s, if you wanted to watch a film, you had to go to the cinema. Then, in the autumn of 1975, the first Sony Betamax went on sale. The Sony Betamax. Its only purpose is to serve you. Within two years, the first video store had opened up in Los Angeles. By 1981, 10% of American households had a VHS player. By 1983, that had risen to 30%, and that same year, 1.1 billion videos individually were hired from video stores around America. It also became much cheaper to make and release films on videotape, a method that suited the lowbrow aspirations of the slasher genre. So in the 80s, home video became the medium of choice for the genre. Two of the most popular titles on VHS in 1982, for example, and this is in any genre, were The Dawn That Dripped Blood and Honeymoon Horror. As a quick aside, if you're looking for an excellence or you want to just extend your knowledge, I suggest looking up something about the background of video nasties, which include films like I Spit On Your Grave, seen here playing at the Springfield Drive-In from the vantage point of our Pooh's roof garden, and that joke becomes funny when you know what the film's about. Anyway. With the movement to home cinema and videotape providing a cheaper avenue for making and releasing X-rated flesh and gore heavy films, the average horror consumer could watch endless marathons of their favorite genre in the privacy of their own home. The natural result of all this VHS consumption was that that same horror consumer became quickly aware of the codes and conventions of the genre and ultimately the brainless stupidity of a lot of what they were watching. Given all this, it's no surprise that Slasher was underperforming economically by the late 1980s. By 1989, for example, the Friday the 13th franchise had already reached number 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, which went on to be its biggest flop. Although I kind of like parts of this film. You are dead meat, slime bag! Yo, man, it's cool. It's cool, man. It's cool. 
And here's what eminent film critic Roger Ebert, rest in peace, said about the slasher film Terror Train in 1980. Note that even by this stage he was already suffering genre fatigue. The classic horror films of the 1930s appealed to the intelligence of its audiences, to their sense of humor and irony. Movies like Terror Train and all of its sordid predecessors and its rip-offs still to come just don't care. They're a series of sensations strung together on plot. Any plot will do, just don't forget the knife and the girl and the blood. When a genre doesn't change or evolve, audiences tune out. At best it becomes a joke, at worst it becomes fundamentally tedious. And frankly, you can only see so many teenagers massacred before it's no longer intellectually stimulating. Wes Craven's 1996 film Scream was a massive antidote to a dying slasher genre, and it's an excellent example of a genre product evolving to meet a new audience. Just like all its other slasher brethren, Scream owes a huge debt to Psycho, which it pays off in the first scene by killing a popular blonde actress. The difference here is that this is homage rather than ripoff. Scream pitched itself as self-aware horror. For the first time outside of a Woody Allen film, the characters seemed to be awake to the idea that they were actually in a movie and they were savvy to all the codes and conventions of the genre that they inhabited. Check out these examples. Can I be the helpless victim? Okay, let's see. No, please don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I want to be in the sequel. You should never say who's there. Don't you watch scary movies? It's a death wish. You might as well just come out here to investigate a strange noise or something. It's all, it's all a movie. It's all one great big movie. There's even a character who works in a video store, a representative of a generation of teenagers raised on genre conventions, who lists the rules one needs to follow in order to survive a horror film. Jesus Christ, you don't know the rules? Uh, have an aneurysm, why don't you? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. And in another scene, he all but breaks the fourth wall and tells us how the whole movie is going to end. I'm telling you, the dad's a red herring. It's Billy. He even insults the film's audience, suggesting that horror audiences aren't particularly sophisticated or complex people. Why would he want to kill his own girlfriend? There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. That's the beauty of it all. Simplicity. Besides, if it gets too complicated, you lose your target audience. That said, even though the film knows all the codes and conventions of a horror film, and makes fun of them, it very rarely breaks any of them. Check out what Sydney says when she's talking to Ghostface on the phone. What's your face? Oh, come on, you know I don't watch that shit. Why not? Too scared. No, no, it's just, what's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Then, moments later, she's found she's locked herself in and is forced to double back and head up the stairs, thus fulfilling the genre convention, but in a way that doesn't insult the intelligence of the audience. <laughs> Ultimately, it was this hip ability to undercut itself and speak to its audience that made Scream a huge success, both reflecting the change in its audience and helping to push the genre forward. Scream cost $15 million to make and returned $173 million at the box office. It's spawned three sequels. Cause let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. And it paved the way for the resurgence and profitability of the teen slasher. Without Scream, we wouldn't have, among other films, I Know What You Did Last Summer, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, I'll always know what you did last summer. We wouldn't have Urban Legend, Urban Legend's Final Cut, or Urban Legend's Bloody Mary. And we wouldn't have Final Destination 1, 2, and 3, The Final Destination, or Final Destination 5, the great franchise where slightly awful people die in creatively awful ways. Even the Scary Movie series was proof of how important Scream was to the genre. As the theory goes, you don't get a parody unless you're popular enough for people to recognize. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Not in my movie. Has the slasher genre moved on since Scream? Hard to say. There have been remakes and sequels and prequels and every other kind of standardized and pseudo-individualized C-grade carbon copy, but nothing necessarily to move the genre forward. You have to remember that it's a genre of investment and return, 
so there's still a huge reliance on pre-existing material. Why chance something new when you can just remake Friday the 13th, Halloween, or Nightmare on Elm Street, but this time with awesome CGI and with stars that teenagers recognize? And this is typical of the horror genre as a whole, not just slasher. You could point to something like The Cabin in the Woods, which is meta, i.e. it knows it's a film and it knows that you know it's a film, but although it's doing it really well, it is still just doing the same sort of thing as Scream. Or you could look at something like Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, a comedy horror that puts the audience on the side of the hillbillies as they accidentally kill the teens. All right, so just help me. Oh, okay, okay, oh, oh. okay, okay, okay. It's funny and engaging, but it's only looking at the narrative from a different angle, not fundamentally changing it. Scream 4 tried to reproduce the magic by massively overdoing the self-referential analysis. The opening sequence is a film inside a film inside a film inside a film. The characters explicate about the ever-evolving rules of the subgenre while streaming live video. But this is more of a slasher extension than a reinvention, and I don't think it was popular enough to say it pushed the genre forward. One of the clearest arguments is that the slasher genre is still alive. It's simply mutated into what New Yorker writer David Edelstein called torture porn. Films like Saw or Hostel, where gore and suffering are the point, and we lose sight of who exactly we're supposed to identify with. Maybe we just have to admit that although there might be more than one way to skin a teenager, so what? Artistically and intellectually, the subgenre of slasher probably doesn't have that much more to offer. I am frightened of you. What does that do to you? Vera Dyker's 1990 book, Games of Terror, stated that the genre's appeal to the audience was threefold. Audiences watched for catharsis, a purge of their fears. For recreation, the cheap roller coaster like thrills. And for displacement, suggesting the audiences live through the sexual desires of the characters in the films. And that's all well and good. But you do have to remember that even when it's employing irony or self awareness, the slasher genre is still basically stupid and frequently both sadistic and misogynistic. Because there it is, and this is something that Hitchcock tapped into. The slasher represents some of the darkest parts of Western culture. A society that deifies youth and beauty and promotes hedonism, vanity and sexual liberation. But it also hates those things. And if the slasher did anything, it put the audience on the side of the killer and made them complicit. One of the most recognizable camera conventions from the slasher is the killer's POV. The slasher can often be a kind of proxy death ritual, almost Christian in the way it protects the virgin and punishes the slut and the sinner, whether male or female. Yet, while it wants you to agree that yes, the murder was in some ways justified, it also asks you to admire the death, to luxuriate in it, to say, yes, Freddy, that was a good kill. It was creative. It was inventive. You ended that person's life in an aesthetically pleasing way. What a nicely severed head. Oh yes, Norman, you killed her good. Look at her reach out like that. It's almost beautiful. Because modern slashes certainly are about the deaths, and it's hard to argue otherwise. Just look at the way the YouTube community has shorn these films down into death compilations. It's about cutting through the foreplay of dialogue and tension building and pushing straight through to the stabbing. And remember that the slasher is just about always set in some suburban idyll like Haddonfield or Woodsboro or Elm Street. Or alternatively, it's some coming of age focal setting like a school dorm or a sweet summer camp. These are the settings of its audience, Western teens who want to see their own lives reflected back at them. And although the audience is modern and progressive on the surface, these films couldn't exist unless there was also some primitive desire for death and revenge, to cut something open, to find some catharsis in the blood of a sacrifice. And at the very worst, you could argue that some of the motives of the viewers of the genre seem to reflect the motives of this guy, Elliot Rogers, the 2014 I Love List of Spree Killer, who at one point went after girls in a sorority house. All you girls who rejected me and looked down upon me, you know, treated me like scum, and all of you men, for living a better life than me, all of you sexually active men, I hate you. I hate all of you. And I can't wait to give you exactly what you deserve. Utter annihilation. Finally, what I've covered in this video and the previous video is by no means the end or even really the beginning of the horror genre. For your own study, you can use what we've talked about here, or you can look up your own films. Other genre strains of horror could also include Zombies, torture porn, found footage, demons in possession, the globalization of horror, video game horror. Outside of that, there's going to be a list of references and various things at the bottom of the video, and uh, I don't need to say any more, do I?
Do we need to say any more? Watch prom night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula.